Syzygy, episode 50, Imposter Comet. And welcome back to another edition of the Syzygy Podcast. My name's Chris Stewart, sitting opposite me at the table, as ever, Emily Brunsden. Hey, Emily. Hello, hello. So this week we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about involving comets. Imposter comets. Imposter comets, the best kind. Comets from other places other than our solar system, which is really cool. Apparently, actually, there have been a couple of these now, quite literally a couple. So we'll talk about that today. But before we do get into all of that comedy stuff... There's a few things we need to talk about. First of all, there's been a very cool spacewalk this week. Yes, yes. We had the first all-female spacewalk from the International Space Station. Which they had to get special spacesuits for because, go figure, spacesuits for spacewalks weren't designed for women. Who saw that coming? Yep. Had to get all the right sizes, or yep. at least the right number of the right sizes, so that this could happen. And yes, it's all been very, very successful. Which is a you know another really good milestone in the history of space. It's a little bit sad that it's taken until 2019 to have the first all-female spacewalk, but the fact that it has happened is a most excellent thing. Fantastic. I was reading the other day about um, the upcoming NASA Artemis program. That's where the, that's the going back to the moon program from NASA. And they are explicitly saying, first one, going to land people back on the moon. It's going to be the first woman and the next man on the on the moon which i think if you're going to have a goal that's a good one it's really like great that. it's really yeah. great yep and they even showed off some of their new spacesuit designs which mm-hmm. included a woman um, modeling these lovely spacesuits so yep. it's really good to see nasa engaging with the more diverse uh, population yes well i mean if you've got slightly over 50 percent of the population being women probably makes sense that you might design some stuff for them so that they can do their work in space. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Being designed by women as well. I uh, saw an interview the other day by one of the, the chief uh, spacesuit engineers uh, who is a woman designing them for the women in space. It's, look, it's about time. It's all good news. Yeah, fantastic. So well done all on that one. The other thing we need to talk about is just, again, a little heads up. We've got a special event of our own coming up in november the evening of friday the 22nd of november um up in thirsk in yorkshire in north yorkshire the um the galactic center of podcasting as everyone knows there is going to be the podcast social club the first ever event which is being put on by the group who brought you the deer shed festival very very cool festival a great festival up here in yorkshire and they're gathering podcasts across all flavors of podcasts like we're going to be there. We're doing astronomy, as we always do. But there's podcasts about vets and there's podcasts about food and there's podcasts about books and like you name it. If you're interested in podcasts, you're going to find something. And if you want to come along and be in the audience, that's what this is all about. Live shows for two days. And so you need to go to podcastsocialclub.com. Check out the various pods that are on offer. Sign up for, for a seat in the audience for one or many especially us on the evening of Friday the 22nd. And we hope to see you there in the audience. It's going to be a great time. I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be very good. So go and get your ticket, podcastsocialclub.com. Now, on with this week's astronomical topic, we are talking about comets. One comet in particular. Well, one in particular. There's one that's made the news. And why is this one special? Because it's the very first comet that we've found that's come from another star system. Very first one. Now, I seem to remember that there was talk a while ago of a comet which seemed to be, as you put it earlier, an imposter in our solar system. Wasn't that the first one? It sort of was. And then, well, so this is what you're referring to, is the wonderfully named Oumuamua. Yes, yes, from, was, the, from the Hawaiian. From the Hawaiian, which actually means distant messenger. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. Good name. Really and if nice. we are pronouncing that incorrectly, apologies to anyone. And do feel free to let us know. So this was in 2017, Yep, uh, we found this, and we thought it was a comet to begin with, but it turns out it didn't have all kind of the stuff that comets should have. Oh, okay, so it was comet-like, comet-adjacent, yeah, uh, comet-curious perhaps, but not, uh, not an actual by Hoyle comet. So it's kind of now called an asteroid? Okay. With the inflection at the end of that, because we're not 100% sure if it's that either. So there's either. an implicit question mark at the end of that statement. It's an asteroid, maybe? Whereas the one that is in the news this week is definitely a comet. Definitely a comet. 100% comet has all the things a comet should have. Okay. So we need to delve into this. Why don't we start with, Emily, if Oumuamua was not a comet and this one is a comet, could you please help us to tease this one out? 
what's a comet? <laughs> what makes a comet a comet and what makes a not comet a not not a comet? So a comet is very classically what you'd expect a comet to be. You know that when you've seen pictures of um, Hale-Bopp, for example, and you maybe have even seen a comet like uh, Shoemaker-Levy go into Jupiter, mm -hmm. or you may have seen uh, Hale-Bopp um, Hale was in the Northern Hemisphere a few years ago. So the, these are these things that are kind of have a nucleus of a core, and then they've got these beautiful long tails, these glowing streams that come out the back of them. Yes, I'm, I'm old enough to remember Halley's Comet. When what was that? Was that the eighties? The last time it came around, six. I think yeah, it was. and there yep. was it was all over the papers. Like Halley's Comet's coming. It's going to be huge, and and every school kid at the time imagined down in Australia the entire sky covered with this comety thing. Um, but I, you know, you could see it in the night sky, and it was a smudge. But it yeah. was a definite comety smudge. It had mm. the sort of you know had the nucleus as you call it at the at the front, and then the smudgy bit down across behind it. It really did look quite comety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was lucky enough to see um, Hellbop when it was in the Northern Hemisphere. This would have been in the 1990s, late 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, and that looked like, yeah, just a glowing smudgy ball. Okay. Pull it apart. What's the, what's the anatomy of a comet then? Why does it have this long tail? What's it made of? What's it doing? Okay. So let's go with the nucleus first. This sure. is the ball. That's actually kind of the mass of the comet. So this is what we traditionally call comets dirty snowballs. Okay. Because they're mostly ice but they've got other little bits of dirt and dust in them as well. So it's kind of fun if you want to make your own comet. You can use uh, carbon dioxide, stick some gravel and some dirt in there, and that's kind of loosely what we talk about so as a dirty snowball. when you say dirty snowball, you're not talking water ice. It can be all sorts of different ices. Right, yeah. okay. Because you just said carbon carbon dioxide. Yeah. So carbon dioxide is nice to use because it gives this lovely smoky... Oh, I see. Right, right. Coming yeah, yeah. It, gotcha. it sublimates. Which is actually what a comet does as well. So as the comet travels, it comes from the very, very outer reaches of our solar system from a place called the Oort cloud, mm -hmm. super far out. But as it comes into the solar system, it gets closer to the sun and it's strange elliptical orbit. It gets warmer. And so the ice starts to sublimate off the surface of the comet. And that ice is what starts glowing and leaving this lovely tail behind the comet. Right. So as it's warming up, so it doesn't have the tail all the time, just as it comes in closer to the sun. But presumably this starts still some way off from the sun. It's not when it's yeah. only when yeah. it's right down close to it. Um, but it starts warming up and melting Basically, sublimating. yeah, sublimating, yeah, going straight from ice to gas. Right. Okay. And so it's that gas trail coming off the back of it from the warming of the sun that we see as the comet's tail. Yeah. Right. And that tail always points away from the sun. But Makes the, sense. But the comet could be traveling in any direction. Right. So okay. it's kind of weird to think about actually when the comet returns to the outer solar system, it can kind of be barreling into its own tail. Okay. So, right. The, the gas is coming off it because it's it's basically been pu being pushed away by the radiation from the sun, irrespective of which way the comet's actually travelling. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. Because yeah. you tend to sort of think of the comet a little bit more like a, like your mental image of a shooting star, right? Yeah. That, that the trail is left behind by the comet as it whooshes through. But that's not what's happening. No, right? it's the, the sun's atmosphere and warmth ah, that's pushing yeah. it off. Yeah. There you so go. when I say behind the comet, I'm being a little bit naughty with language. There. Right. It's kind of behind it on its way in, although even then that's that's not quite the case. Hmm. And as you say, on its way out, it's actually you know, barreling through its, through its own tail, which is odd. There we hmm. are. Okay. So quick question. Um, it's coming from the Oort cloud, which is way, way out beyond the planets yep. of the solar system. One of the one of the outer bits of anything that we could call our, our solar system. Why do you get lumps of of dirty ice out there? Yeah, where's, where's that from? Well, they're just leftover bits of solar system, basically. Right. So they formed way out there to begin with, and they were just left in clumps. They've been slowly growing as time goes on. If you get two sticky things and they stick together, you can grow into larger and larger objects. But basically, it was just all the stuff that didn't make it into a planet. And if it was a gas and it was out there, then it froze because it's so cold. Right, right. Because I am sort of imagine when I think of an Oort cloud, I, I think of an asteroid belt. I think of the sort of thing that, you know, in, in the Empire Strikes Back Star Wars film, where they're sort of whooshing through all these rocks in space. That's what I imagine the Oort cloud to be. But that's not a comet. I mean, I, I'm not imagining a big dirty ice cube or snowball. Um, but it kind of makes sense if you think about what, 
the constituents of the early solar system would have been. There would have been all sorts of stuff. There would have been the dusty bits that turned into rocky bits, and there would have been lots of gases, which then freeze, and that's the ice mm-hmm. that, you, that yep. you're talking about. So having big chunks of icy stuff, whether that's water, ice, or frozen any gas kind of makes sense yeah and okay but that's very sparse so when you sort of think about navigating through an asteroid wouldn't be an field, issue no it wouldn't yeah. be an issue yeah and there probably aren't rocks with enormous sort of sock puppet lizards in them either but anyway. hopefully not no yeah. but uh so the comets tend to be on these crazy orbits uh where they come into the inner solar system and then fly out again so this is why for example halley's comet comes back every 80 uh years or so it's on this cr- really really elliptical orbit it comes in swings quite close to the sun and then travels way back out into the outer reaches and why are they on those orbits is it is it just simply that i mean they could be on any orbit but we tend to not see the ones which are on really really big orbits that don't come anywhere close to us we tend to see the ones that come into the inner solar system is it is it sort of a selective thing like that it's, it's part of that but it's also because you've got so much gravitational interaction with other big things so if you've got a lump of ice that was originally in quite a nice steady orbit um, maybe it was even out where the giant planets are in our solar system. Then if you get disrupted by something like Jupiter or Saturn, right. then you're going to have a crazy orbit after Jupiter that. wanders on past and says, hey, drags you down this way. And suddenly, without warning, you're being flung towards the sun. Yeah. But you miss the sun, whip around the back of it and go back out into this big elliptical orbit again. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So that's a comet. Mm-hmm. And the vast majority... Let's let's say all the comments that we've ever seen before have been from within our own solar system. They're these large elliptical weird orbits, but they're coming from way out on the on the farthest reaches of the of the solar system. So that's all fine. That's yeah. comets. Good. This week we've seen something a little bit different. Or not maybe not this week. Recently we've seen something a little bit different. Yeah. So first of all. Who's seen what? Who can we credit with this? Well, let's rewind back to our very first time that we spotted okay. this object. So this was actually spotted by a guy, an amateur astronomer, um, who works in what we call near-Earth objects. Now, NEOs, and these are basically people, and there's a lot of amateurs around the world who do this, um, who look for unusual objects. Because if you have something like an asteroid in the vicinity of Earth, you might not see it until it's quite close. Well, they're really small. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, even the big ones, they're really small because space is big. Exactly. And asteroids are not very bright. No. They're not very shiny, basically. However, comets are quite bright and shiny because they're mostly icy. So they reflect quite a lot of light. So easier to see. Now, the, the amateur astronomers who are looking for these near-Earth objects, why are they doing that? Are they doing that because... They fear that we're all going to die if we get hit by one. Is that no, the idea? No, it's just, it's just a, a wonderful thing to contribute to science, basically. Okay. So people will go out and look for these objects. Um, if you find an object that you think is a new thing, you can post it up and say, look, I think this is a thing. Other people will go and check it, basically, and will confirm. And after a little while, we'll be able to work out the orbits of these things. Is it going to be dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a branch of astronomy which is still kind of at that, that, that very early stage of astronomy of astronomy style, which is we're scanning the skies. We're comparing, you know, an exposure taken at this time with an exposure taken at that time to see if anything's moved. We're looking for things in the sky that are moving that we haven't seen before, exactly. which is kind of cool, isn't it? Is it is really nice. Yeah, yeah. So the astronomer who um, found this, the amateur, was a Crimean guy called uh, Gennady Borisov. Mm-hmm. And actually the comet is named after him. As That's cool. Tradition in comets, That's actually. Cool. Uh, it's called 2i Borisov. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 2 means it's the second. Right. And i means it's um, interstellar, basically. Oh, okay. So from, not from our solar system. So 2i, that means that there was a 1i. Was that Umuma? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Even though, question mark, comment. Uh, yeah, sorry, but it's, still, mark, it's still an object that came from not our solar okay. system. Right. Um, yeah, so he was looking with a 0.65 meter telescope. 0.65 centimeter. That's quite big. It's quite a big telescope. Yeah, yeah. You know, so quite a serious amateur. He actually built it himself, which I think was wow. pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, and this was the 30th of August that he reported this discovery, um, set it up, and then it's been followed basically ever since. So the first images that we got from this were uh, published in September. And uh, we, I, most of the research that I've done has been following a nature paper that's been following up on this from ground-based telescopes, which was published by Guzik et al., um, who was a Polish team. 
uh, who published the paper, all their findings basically from lots of different observations uh, in, on the 14th of October. So it's quite a fast moving yeah. Yeah. piece of science. Well, so really. spotted in August and then lots of follow up over the subsequent couple of months, and here we are in October. Yeah. Now, it, this, the original Borisov, was it? Borisov, yeah. Yeah. He wasn't looking for comets. No, just any but, of these near Earth objects. Now, is this comet near Earth or was it just fortunate that it happened to say, hang on, there's a smudge. What's that? So if we use a unit of measurement that mm-hmm. is the distance between the Earth and the Sun yep. as a kind of ruler, uh, then it was about four times that distance when it was discovered. Okay. So okay. It's so not that's super far away. Yeah. Just for comparison, how far away is Jupiter? For example. So about five. Okay, so it's between us and Jupiter, between between but Mars and Jupiter. But not on the same kind of. It's coming in from the top, basically. Sure. Okay, like, but in terms of distance. System. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. So it's, it was then imaged most recently by Hubble in October. Um, Hubble got some amazing. Yeah, some pictures really, of this. really quite clear. Like not not clear as in oh look, there's a lump of rock, but clear as in that's definitely a comet. There's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. So when Hubble imaged it, it was about two point eight. Um, Earth Sun units, astronomical units, and it's going to come closest approach, maybe about two. Closest approach to us. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's actually quite close. Yeah. So yeah. basically between Mars and Jupiter. Okay. It's going to be nice, and that's um, we might have some better chances to see it when it comes back. But we'll we'll get to that uh, towards the end of how you can maybe yes find and you spot too this can kind of see thing. a comet. So now the obviously the interesting thing about this is the is the eye. In the name, to I, Borisov, mm-hmm. the I being interstellar, as in not from our solar system. So I guess we can start with, how do we know? How yeah. do we know that? How do we know this is an alien Yeah, rather than just a random comet that's come from our own Oort cloud? So the way we mostly um, do, know, do know this is basically because of the speed it's traveling. Okay. So we can measure, after we've tracked it for a while, we can measure basically what orbit this object is on, if it's indeed an orbit, uh, and what speed it's traveling at. Mm-hmm. And so this object is traveling on what we call a hyperbolic trajectory. So it's kind of like an open uh, U shape, but even or but right. somewhere between a U and a V. It's it's really wide shape. So it's not it's not a closed ellipse like like the other uh, like the other comets where it comes in nice and close to the sun, whips around, goes right out, but eventually turns around and comes back again on this big long elliptical loop. If the faster you go, that ellipse eventually, <laughs> if you like mathematically breaks apart into no it's not an ellipse anymore we're just coming in winging around the sun and then heading off in a different direction off into space again yeah that's the idea amazingly it's barely going to notice that the sun is there wow that's how fast it's traveling because it's coming in quite close it's coming like, in it would it's well and close, truly within yeah. the sun's gravitational well so it's it is there how fast is it going so uh what's your favorite unit i I don't know how how do you measure the speed of comets? I don't know <laughs> kilometers an hour. <laughs> Does yeah. it make any so, sense? Well, we could go with kilometers an hour. It's Let's about do it. One hundred and seventy-seven thousand kilometers per hour. Okay, in anyone's money, that's very fast. That's very fast. I thought actually it might be a little bit easier, so I did uh, recalculate all the numbers okay. back down to kilometers per second. Okay, because then you can kind of get in one second it's going to yep. travel yep. many kilometers. So this is about forty-nine kilometers every second which is which is very fast but i guess it's very difficult to get a sense of just how fast that is because i mean we talked about this before emily like space is big things move quickly things evolve slowly like time and speed and distance are weird in space in astronomy so we got any points of comparison here well i did look up how fast halley's comet travels when it's closest to the sun and that's one which is in an, an elliptical orbit yes so a closed orbit, how fast does that go? So that goes 55 kilometers per second. But that's at its point of closest approach to yeah. the sun. And the difference is that it comes in really close to the sun, it's very much affected by the sun's gravity, and it loops around the sun itself. Whips around the back really quickly, um, but that's because it gets so close. Yeah. So in contrast, this one, if you imagine the plane of our solar system, um, and we're all orbiting in this plane, uh, all the planets, then this one's kind of coming in from the top. It's going to swing through this plane of the solar system, out the bottom, and just a little bit of a bend, but then it's kind of on its merry way again. So it's sort of wandering its way through the universe, and then it just goes, oh, what was that? Oh, I think it was a star. Anyway, off we go. Yeah. <laughs> Barely notices coming through. Okay. So what is it that makes this thing a 
comet then? I mean, if all the other comets that we've ever seen have come from pretty much the same place, way out on the far flung reaches of the solar system, and they're all kind of the same, then why why is this one a comet? So this one is remarkably like a comet that we have in our solar system. I mean, so Oumuamua didn't have this kind of dusty tail that you could see, this glowing um, part around it. Whereas this one... the very early images started to show this beautiful glow that was around the comet, and we can now see that very, very clearly. Okay, so it's that that makes it a comet. Oumuamua didn't have that, and so it's basically just a rock. As you said, it's a, it's an asteroid? Question mark? Question mark. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was back in 2017. And yeah. I remember there being a lot of stuff in the in the papers, which even went as far as, oh, it's a bit weird, maybe it's an alien space... It's not an alien it's space... Not alien it's just space. a weird-shaped lump of rock winging it's, through our... Yeah. yeah, and that's worth mentioning that it is really weirdly shaped as well. Yeah, it's sort of cigar-shaped, it's isn't it? It's really the, long and thin, yeah. much, even more than a cigar, more like a pencil. Yeah, weird, but just a lump of rock. Whereas this one, to one Borisov, which is much easier to say, thank you, um, it's got all the characteristics of your common or garden variety comet. It's got this central nucleus bit and the tail coming off the back, but it's not from our solar system. It's come from somewhere else. Yep. And actually, when I was reading the paper, this is one of my favourite quotes from the abstract of the Nature paper. Uh, the observed morphology is unremarkable. Oh, okay. That almost sounds like a backhanded, backhanded compliment. Um, so let's pick that one apart. The observed morphologies, in other words, what we see that it looks like and is made up of, yeah, yep. is unremarkable. Unremarkable. As in, yep, that's about what we'd expect for a comet. Now, in and of itself, that's maybe not surprising. Comets is comets, right? We see them all the time and we know what they're like. But the surprising bit about that is... It's it's not from around here. It's no. not from these parts. This has come from somewhere very, very different. So the fact that the observed morphology was unremarkable, is that remarkable? Was that yeah, surprising? Indeed, yeah. And the sentence in itself means that it is remarkable, that it's unremarkable. <sighs> Couldn't they just say that? I know. <laughs> but I just love it because very rarely will you end up in your scientific research saying the observations we made were fairly unremarkable. Yes. But the lovely irony of that is, and that in itself is remarkable. Yeah. So, I mean, did we expect a comet from somewhere else to be so similar to what we see? No, is the short answer. We definitely expect lots of comets and other objects to be cruising around our solar system um, from other places. There's no reason for there not to be. You okay. know? We're in a galaxy where there's lots of other stars. There's stuff winging formed. around all over the place. They've sent things out in all sorts of crazy uh, orbits in the galaxy. So it's, un, you know, it's unsurprising that we can find these objects. I mean, I'm guessing that these things are, are winging through our solar system at all angles at all times. I mean, there must be lots of them out there, but by their very nature they're going to be pretty hard to see. Yeah. yeah. So we estimate hundreds, thousands of these objects at any one point in time. Okay. So we found this one. The weird thing is that it is so similar. So similar, yeah. Because you would imagine if you were in a solar system that was forming comets, maybe they would form slightly differently to how they would in our solar system. Slightly differently in terms of composition? like, like In terms what? of composition, yeah. definitely. In terms of size, in terms of what morphology even what the shapes of the these are, things are because not all stars are the same sure not all planets are the same as we've learned yeah. but are all comets therefore the same hmm. so it could be that i mean because our our stats are so low on this one we've seen we've got an n of two of things from other places winging their way through our solar system that we've spotted and have taken a really good look at and that's not terribly good stats so it could just be that this comet happens to be very much like our own, but is not terribly representative of comets from other places per se. Maybe, or it could yeah. be that all comets are just like that. We don't know. Not yet. Hmm. But we've got some wonderful measurements of this thing. Cool. So we can, That's we can, always good. We can nail these things down. So the um, discovery papers and some of the following um, work that's been done using lots of wonderful telescopes. Obviously, Hubble mm -hmm. has been taking some great images. We've got the William Herschel telescope, which is a 4.2 meter telescope. It's a big one. in La Palma. And Gemini North, which is one of the biggest telescopes, so 8.2 metres. It's in that class of big, big ones. Big, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so we've been able to see the coma, which is the, the tail of the comet. So we'll see the, that's gas and dust and make some measurements about what it's actually made of as well. And we can see that there's got cyanide in this comet. Oh, nice. That sounds like it's, it's I mean, weird and nasty, yeah. but that's, that's actually normal for comets. Oh, that's comets. normal for yeah, comets. Yeah. Okay. Because cyanide is just carbon and nitrogen. Right. Okay. So All right. Those are two very elemental building blocks of solar systems. Sure. So don't go and hang out in the comet's tail, basically, is the message there, but otherwise unremarkable. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's also got diatomic carbon, so C2. Uh, That's also unremarkable. Right. Comets should have a lot of carbon in them. There's a lot of carbon in solar systems. So what is interesting that you can kind of measure is not just the fact that these things are present, but the ratios of those two things. So how much cyanide is there compared to how much diatomic carbon? carbon is there sure i mean that's what you can do basically in astronomy when you're looking at something is okay well what's there and then are the ratios of those the, the quantities of those the relative quantities is that what we see elsewhere and that's how you can kind of figure out is this like that yeah yeah and it's that ratio that's super similar to lots of the comets that we see in right. our own solar system and at that level okay i can begin to see that maybe wasn't expected right maybe yeah. you would expect to see sure carbon yep cyanide fine whatever but would you expect those ratios to be just spot on for things that we see from our own solar system? Maybe not. Maybe not, yeah. but they are. That's Turns very, out. Very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Uh, so then we can think about, well, okay, where did the comet come from? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, I guess, follow the, the direction backwards and say, well, it came from that part of the sky. But can we do better than that? Yeah, we can a bit. I mean, it's, it's not easy. And mm. I have to stress that all of these results are very preliminary and have big asterisks next to all of them. Well, we've it's, only seen it for a couple of months. Exactly. You know, give us some time. But it's also very hard measurements to do because not you, currently we see this comet in the, near the constellation of Cassiopeia, okay. which is in the northern hemisphere. So kind of the big W or McDonald's sign if you're so inclined. Depending on which way you're facing. Yep. Uh, so this constellation, and we can see it there now, and we can say where it's going to go in the future with quite – certain results but to backtrack the problem is that the further back you go all the stars are moving right so the whole galaxy is rotating and if you go back even a little bit then all those stars are moving positions and you've got to track all where they have been and if you have a slight uncertainty the further back you go the bigger that uncertainty gets yeah i guess if you like you can see quite accurately i would imagine with these big honkin telescopes um you'd be able to get a really good angle on that trajectory but it, you know, it, it's got uncertainty in it. And that's kind of a cone stretching out across space that gets wider and wider and wider the further back you go. It's like it could be from somewhere within that cone. Add, in, add on to that that, as you say, the stars are moving. And I'm guessing you've probably got quite a few different possible systems that it could have come from. Well, there's actually just the one at the moment that's oh, okay. been hypothesized. Well, it, all, we can say for sure that it's been close to the system. Right. Whether it's come from the system or it just happened to pass by that one as well. Well, wow, that's sure cool. That's, I, I wouldn't have expected that. I would have, I would have thought very naively knowing nothing, which is the way I tend to operate, that there would have been a whole host of, well, it could have come from, you know, this bunch of stars, but one. Well, there's a lot of space between stars, we have to yeah, remember. Yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. So the one that um, has been fingered as maybe the uh, culprit, if you like, of this imposter, is Kruger 60. Uh, it always, I always wondered about Kruger 60. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got that look in its eye. So obviously not a system I'd ever heard of before, so <laughs> I had to go and have a look and see. It's actually an interesting system in its own right, but then, you know, I'm kind of into stars. So. Yeah, you're an astronomer. You have to find it interesting. It's like all of your children. You yeah. have no favorites. Exactly. Uh, it's a binary system. Mm -hmm. So that's already quite cool. Yeah. Uh, and two red dwarf stars. Okay. So these are very, very small, very, very cool stars. Um, and they're both M dwarfs. So really kind of the lower end of what's possible for stars. So very, very red. And these two binary red dwarfs are about 13 light years away. All right, so that's not hugely far away, an no. interesting system. It's in and, our local neighbourhood. And we're pretty confident that it's, if not originating there, then have it, has at least passed through there or yeah. close to there. Well, the specifics are about a million years ago, it passed within 5.7 light years of this system. Um, 
that sounds to me like a fairly large margin of error, but I'm going to take your take your word for it, Emily, that that's reasonably accurate. I don't it's, know. It's, it's reasonably accurate, yeah. Okay, yeah. so th- what, what's interesting, though, is because you've got this binary system, there's a lot of gravitational dynamics going on. Sure. So the two stars um, orbit each other within about the distance between the Sun and Saturn uh, in our solar system. Okay. But they're not circular. It's not a circular binary orbit. It's quite eccentric. So it changes by about 50% of right. that Right, okay. Size. So sometimes the stars are quite close and sometimes they're quite far apart. Exactly. Right. So that change that makes gravity weird and difficult to I would map. guess so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the possibility of such a system kicking out things is pretty high, basically. Right. What you're saying is that, that if there is anything in orbit around or near these things, it's likely not going to be a terribly stable orbit. And things are going to get either smashing down into the stars themselves or flung out at, at great speeds and angles. Yeah. I mean, if you were in a really nice, wide, circular orbit, you'd probably be fine. These sure. two would just go around each other in the middle. You'd get a bit of a wobble every But if you're on any kind of eccentric orbit and you kind of come into the middle at the wrong time, then the chances of being thrown out are quite high. Right. Okay. So... There's a reasonable possibility, probability that this thing has come maybe from that system, which is a cool system in and of itself. Yeah, quite literally. Nice one. No. Boom, boom. Uh, see what you did there. Okay. Well, that's all very nice. How long is is it going to be? How long is Borisov going to be in our neck of the woods before it wings its way off across the cosmos again? Well, we've got a few months still yeah. to observe it, which is great because with um, the previous imposter, Oumuamua, we didn't have a lot of time. We only had sort of about 40 days All right, to observe okay. it. But we got much longer for this one. Well, you said it was first seen in August and it was, what did you say? It was a bit closer than Jupiter at yeah, that at time? that point, yeah. Okay, so, so we've got another couple of months before it gets out the other side. Yeah, so it's going to be closest to the sun, which will be when the um, tail is the brightest. It will be in about the 7th of December. Okay. And it'll be closest to the earth, well, a little bit after that, 29th of December. So I have seen it's a it comet. called the Christmas Comet, mm-hmm. which is, okay, maybe. However, it's not going to be like Halley's Comet in the sky. So if okay. you want to observe it, you're going to have to do a little bit of planning. Right. So it's not particularly bright for us. No. Okay. No. I mean, it's not bright now. Mm-hmm. It's currently 18th magnitude. Uh, I don't know much about magnitude, but I do know that that's not terribly that's bright. That's not very bright at all. So right. that's kind of like what we, the stars we were looking at with Kepler space telescope. Okay. Okay. At the fainter end of those ones. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so you're not going to just wander out of an evening and go, oh, look, big blobby thing in the sky. It's not going to be like that. No, okay. definitely not. It's so not, how... It's not- how hard is it going to be to well, see this thing or between sort of the 7th and the 10th? So it's not actually going to be a naked eye object at all. Right. So we can very clearly say you're going to need a telescope if you want to see it. Now, it's going to be the brightest with they're predicting something like 15th magnitude. Mm-hmm. Although that is dependent on the comet staying in one piece. Ah, right. There is a possibility if it comes close, when it comes close to the sun, it might break apart like other comets have done. And that's because of the heating from the sun that, that you know, that's a fairly violent process as this stuff's boiling away off the surface, um, that that could just, you know, open up cracks and blow the thing apart. Exactly, yeah. Right. And actually that's interesting because that's maybe what the past history was of a Oumuamua. Ah, okay. It's weird shape. Could yeah. have been that it just ripped itself apart it was a comet at one point and kind of yeah just fell apart all the ice kind of sublimated off and we're left with a long skinny bit of rock Hmm. interesting okay yeah but um okay so 15th magnitude is when it's in december now that is not easy to see uh still so to give you an idea of scale rigel which i think most people on earth can can spot at some point is uh about zero it's a little bit more yeah. Okay. Now, so, re- every, sorry, which one's Rigel? Rigel's in a constellation of Orion. Yeah. So it's the blue one. Okay, the blue one. The big, yeah. bright blue one. Yep. yep. So Rigel, yeah, it's about zero. Now, magnitude scales are a little bit weird. It's historical, as is a lot of stuff in astronomy. <sighs> yep. Um, but every magnitude is basically just over two and a half times brighter. Okay. All or right. fainter. But it goes the wrong way. So zero is brighter than... Eight fifteen 15 or 18. So if you go from, from zero to one, you've gone down in brightness by a factor of two and a half yep. on some particular measure that we won't go into now. And then from one to two, you've gone down two and a half again. Yep. So by the time you get up to 15, 18, 
That's not bright at all. It's not bright at all. I mean, if you go to a very dark spot and you let your eyes adapt, you can see sixth magnitude. Six. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is definitely not, this comet is definitely not viewable with the naked eye. So you're going to need a telescope. Okay. How good a telescope? So I I was, if you've got, the theory, theoretical limit is much, much different to, I think, practical. So I went with a practical limit. Okay. You're probably going to need a 16 inch telescope or bigger. Oh, okay. That's non-trivial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might so need to get together with a friend. And a reasonable see what size. You can find. We have one 16 inch on the Astro Campus mm-hmm. here at York, and it will struggle to get it. We might, if we're lucky and we're careful, and you know, really wait for it to be really dark, then we might be able to get it basically on that one. Yeah, because York's not the best of dark sky environments. We've got a bit of light pollution yeah. coming in, so we, we'd have to be careful with those measurements. But it's but possible. It's possible. Yeah. But okay. it's going to be awfully cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Christmas time observing of, a, of a, a comet winging its way through the solar system, that's kind of fun. An alien comet winging exactly. its way through the solar exactly. system, nonetheless. Yeah. 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 And as I say, it's near Cassiopeia, so it's quite high in the sky for us here in the top of the Northern Hemisphere. Right. Those in the Southern Hemisphere, sorry, this time's not really your time. This one's ours. This one's ours. Okay. So, I mean, is that a realistic thing for, for us to say, look, people out there in listener land – go and give this a shot? Or is this more of a, yeah, look, odds are you probably won't. I would suggest find someone who knows what they're doing. (laughs) That's always good advice. To find this. Uh, So a local astronomical society, Mm -hmm. a local university um, who has a a large-ish telescope or even an observatory that has public openings around about December, um, you know. Go and knock on their door and say, have you got anything bigger than 16? Can we see this? I want to see the alien comet. Show me the alien comet and see what they can do. This is very different from your Halley's Comet or your Halbop, where you can go out and just look with a pair of binoculars or the naked eye. This is You're going to need some help on this one. Yeah. But, you know, how cool is it to see something that has had not even originated in our own solar system? I think that's a pretty impressive uh, thing to go out and try and find. All right. So... To bring this all back around together again, we have a have a, an alien Christmas time comet that, with a bit of help, you might be able to go and see. That's awesome. It is from somewhere else completely. It's from this very interesting binary red dwarf system, however many light years away. That's cool. It's very, very similar to the comets that we see in our own solar system, which is remarkably unremarkable. Emily, what are we learning from this? Why is this an interesting news article in the world of astronomy? So this is the first time we've had a comet from somewhere else. So if we want to learn about... An actual comet as opposed to... We thought it was a comet, it's not a comet. Yeah, Mm. an asteroid. Mm -hmm. I think we should trademark that. Yeah. Um, then if we want to learn about how solar systems form, how star systems form, so far the clues that we've had so far are stars. Mm -hmm. We can see stars. They're quite easy. Uh, Planets. We're getting much, much better at doing planets and all sorts of different um, planets at different distances. Yeah, we're getting um, pretty good at planets. But most of those planets are pretty close to their stars. Yeah. Uh, But we've never seen comets before. That's true. I mean, I guess if you're looking at at what makes a solar system, then you've got stars, planets... Uh, you've got asteroidy things, um, which maybe Oumuamua can tell us a bit about. Maybe not. Who knows? Um, but you've also got comedy things. Comedy things, yeah. And you're starting then to get through the list of, well, these are the things that make a solar system. And so the more you could study these alien interlopers, the more you can learn about how other systems have come about. Exactly. Uh. And so far, it seems that all comets are made the same way. Well, I mean, again, coming back to... So far, yeah, on an N of one. <laughs> like, does, you know, yes, we can learn a lot from this one, but surely we need a few more. We do we? need a few more. Now, with their, you'll be pleased to know there are plans. Ha ha, excellent. Plans. Okay, so because these are unpredictable objects, we don't know when the next one's going to come or at least the next one that we can study well. So we can't, and we couldn't have put up a mission to go and visit this comet like we did with the Rosetta No, mission. don't have a lot of time. In that time frame, no. no. Months is not a time scale in which we can do that. No. So I love this idea of this mission. It's called the Comet Interceptor Mission from ESA. Okay. Planned launch around 2028. Wow, so, this is a thing. Yeah, so it has been selected. It's been Excellent. funded. Um, and the idea with this one, this is really cool, is that basically we set up the Comet Interceptor. We launch it into space. Yep, it's there. It's waiting. We put it in L2. Yep, which is a special location whereby it follows the Earth basically on its orbit around the sun. And when we wait, and then when one of these objects comes, we deploy and we go out and we go and 
catch this coming. Deploy the spacecraft. Go, go. It's like a dog sitting out there, sitting out there waiting. It's like, I'm ready to go. And then go, go and get that one. Yeah. Awesome. So this has been planned for a while before we kind of knew that these extra solar system comets would be available. But the uh, people involved in the mission have already said, you know, well, if we happen to get an alien comet, that would be cool. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Okay, so this one has been not specifically for alien comets. This is we just want to go and and have a look at a comet. Yep. But if one happened to come wandering past, I'm, I'm guessing it would have to come reasonably close to us for that actual, yeah. for that mission to, to be useful there. Is that a single run mission? Is that a, we're going to go and do this and then that's it? It's that? a one comet mission. Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. But if it, so the, the chances of that happening for an alien comet, I guess, are, are fairly fairly limited. Well, I guess you've got to evaluate the science case. What are you going to learn most from? Yeah. So in 2028, we'll know a bit more about what we need to know about sure. comets, if that sure. makes sense. But I would have also thought just purely statistically that they're, that they're, I don't know, maybe not. You tell me. Would there be more solar system comets that we would have a chance of intercepting than non-solar system alien interlopers? That's a good question. We've found two. Yeah, in, we don't know. You know, basically two years. Yeah. So that's not bad. Mm. Um. But we're getting better at finding them. So, right. you know, maybe we will be able to identify more so, and more of these interlopers. So in 10 years or slightly less than 10 years, we'll have a much better notion of that. Yeah. And one way or the other, this little spacecraft is going to go and intercept one. That's cool. Yeah. Like the interceptor mission. That brings us to the end of this particular Comet-tastic edition of the Syzygy Podcast. Emily, I've learned so much about comets today. Comets are amazing. Comets are very, very cool, particularly alien comets. Yeah. I love it. I feel like we should make a comet ice cream. Oh, what would that look like? I guess it'd be... I mean, you describe them as dirty snowballs, so it's not particularly attractive. Well, but... chocolate chips. Yeah, uh, true. It'd be like stracella or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, And then you'd need to have, like, how would you do the tail... I don't know. Pour liquid nitrogen all over. Yeah, there'd have to be liquid nitrogen involved, or at least dry ice or something. We're going to get onto that. Then with Syzygy merch. Yeah, we, <laughs> we need, need to stop recording this when I'm so hungry. Oh. Bad, bad news. Listen, we need to move on. So if you want to get in touch with us, there are a bunch of ways that you can do that. You can do that on social media. Emily, tell us about Syzygy social media. Yes, at Syzygy Pod. Mm -hmm. You can tweet us with all your favorite ice cream ideas for comments. You can. And much, much more. And anything else. You can ask questions. Just send us your thoughts, your comments, your hellos. We'd love to hear from you. And look anywhere on the social medias. If you go and search for us at Syzygy Pod, you're probably going to find us. So give that a try. We also have a website. We do. Syzygy. FM, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. And uh, on all the socials, actually, you'll be able to find things, little tidbits that we put up. I put up a fun little picture the other day. You did. You were off exploring the, the coast over on the east, no, on the west of this lovely country of ours. Yeah, I found a seven-metre sun. You did, and you were holding it up with your pinky. Yeah. Very nice. Really Very fun. nice. It was over in Blackpool? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So go and check us out on there. Get in touch. Say hi. We'd love to hear from you. The other thing that you can do in order to help us out on the show, this would really, really help, is to leave us a review because we like to float up through the noise. There's a lot of podcasts out there. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there are quite a few and we would like to rise up and allow other people to find us and share in the joy of space and astronomy and the cosmos. So leave us a review, give us some stars, tell the world what you think on your podcast client of choice. That would be fantastic. Otherwise, we're going to have to move on out of here. So we'll catch up with you in another week or so. See you later for now. Bye, Emily. Catch you later. Bye, everybody. We might want, well, I definitely want to practice saying umuamua. Oh, yes. Umuamua. Umuamua. Is that how you say it? I don't know. Umuamua. Let's I'm say it. I'm going to go with that. Umuamua. Umuamua. Because the, high, the apostrophe at the start. Yeah, you're what's supposed that about? to say that is a very hard sound. Umuamua. Umuamua. Um, my Hawaiian is just not good enough, I'm mm. afraid. Umuamua. Well, we can invite comment on our pronunciation. Yeah, I love the way you're just like, yeah, let's just get everyone to slander and everything that we get wrong. Yeah. Every, well, you know. Every, everything we pronounce. If people get in touch. That's a good Not, thing. you know, if you've got a question about science and you'd like answers. Hey, look, look, people want to get in touch, they can do whatever they like.